subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Um, I ask uh, our friend from Florida, Ms. Lee, if she'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Without objection, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Ivey, will be able to participate in today's hearing for the purpose of questioning the witness if a member yields him time for that purpose. I see no objection. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Again, I thank the members for coming. I thank the direct, Director Peters for coming today and uh, uh, the audience. We, we appreciate you being here. This hearing is oversight of the Bureau of Prisons. The Federal Bureau of Prisons is a component of the Department of Justice. BOP's mission is to protect society by confining offenders in the controlled environments of prisons and community-based facilities that are safe, humane, cost-efficient, and appropriately secure. And the BOP provides work and other self-improvement opportunities to assist offenders in becoming law-abiding citizens. At a time of rising crime, this is a critically important function. BOP operates 122 institutions and locations throughout the nation. These institutions are operated at five different security levels in order to confine offenders in an appropriate manner. As of last week, BOP is responsible for the custody and care of more than 158,000 inmates and employees, more than 34,000 individuals. Nearly five years ago, President Trump signed in law the First Step Act of 2018. That act sought to reduce the size of the federal prison population and reduce recidivism while still maintaining public safety. The act's three main goals were one, correctional reform, two, sentencing reform, and three, reauthorization of the Second Chance Act of 2007. BOP is charged with much of the implementation of the First Step Act. As I mentioned earlier, we're experiencing a nationwide spike in crime and it's vital that BOP gets this implementation right. The First Step Act required DOJ to develop a system for BOP to use to assess, to assess the risk of recidivism of federal prisoners and to assign prisoners to evidence-based recidivism reduction programs. These programs include literacy programs, occupational educational programs, trade skill programs, and substance use disorder programs. Inmates who complete the recidivism reduction programming can earn additional time credits which allows them to be placed in home confinement or an RRC earlier than they would have been. This is why I said BOP needs to make sure they get it right. We cannot allow criminals to be leaving our prisons early unless we can ensure that they will not reoffend. This subcommittee, subcommittee has examined the implementation of the First Step Act on a bipartisan basis since its passage, and we're continuing that conversation today. However, there's a larger underlying issue that has persistently plagued the successful operation of BOP, including the implementation of the First Step Act. BOP consistently grapples with challenges of low staffing and high attrition rates, intensifying the risk in an already hazardous profession. As I mentioned, BOP employs approximately 35,000 personnel across various prisons and facilities throughout the U.S. That's a 5% decline from the 37,000 employed in 2020, Yet the prison inmate population has not declined. In fact, it's increased by 3,000. As of last month, more than 20% of the 20,446 congressionally authorized corrections officer positions remain vacant. More than two years ago, the GAO published a study identifying several underlying causes for these staffing challenges. The GAO analysis highlighted that BOP had not been proficient in accurately assessing or providing documentation to support its staffing deficits. GAO identified that BOP resorted to amplifying the overtime hours of its personnel to mitigate staffing shortages. As a result, the cumulative overtime hours surged by 102% between 2015 and 2019. This escalation in compulsory overtime imposed significant stress on the BOP workforce, which eroded workplace morale and instigated the departure of seasoned corrections officers. Consequently, these actions amplified the safety vulnerabilities for the remaining personnel and inadvertently extend the wait times for inmates to assess, excuse me, access basic services. 
I know that Director Peters is, is acutely aware of this persistent problem, and I look forward to hearing from her today on the steps that BOP is taking to address the staffing shortage and other issues at the, at the Bureau. I appreciate you being here, Director. I look forward to hearing for you, from you, and I'll yield back. Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, the ranking member, is absent today, and, and Ms. McBath is stepping in in her place, and I recognize her as the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. And regretfully, as you've expressed, uh, ranking member Jackson Lee is unable to attend today's hearing. However, she tells me that she had a good productive meeting with Director Peters yesterday and pledges her continued support of BOP and its mission. In her first year with the Federal Bureau of Prisons, Director Peters has taken noteworthy steps to improve the culture and management of the agency and increase accountability and transparency. She has rooted out employee misconduct, ending the abuse and neglect of inmates, addressing the staffing deficits at BOP facilities, and improving implementation of the First Step Act. As I have said before, incarcerated Americans should not fear death when they enter our federal prison system and correctional officers should not fear for their safety at work. Our pr federal prisons must serve not as just institutions solely for confinement and punishment, but also for rehabilitation and preparation for successful re-entry into society. We, as members of Congress, have a duty to the inmates that are housed in our BOP's facilities the communities that they will eventually return to, and the nearly 40,000 employees in the BOP, I mean, 40,000 employees in 122 BOP institutions across the country. That is why I joined with Representative Kelly Armstrong along with Senators Dick Durbin, John Ossoff, and Mike Braun to introduce the Federal Prison Oversight Act, allowing following a 10-month investigation into corruption, abuse, and misconduct at U.S. Penitentiary Atlanta, where I represent Georgia, and within the entirety of BOP. Across the country, there are numerous cases involving misconduct of BOP employees, ranging from theft of government property, obstruction of justice, and sexually abusing prisoners. These cases do not provide a full picture of employee misconduct at BOP. According to the agency's annual Office of Internal Affairs report, investigators opened 14,361 cases in the most recent three-year period, involving alleged misconduct by a staggering 17,907 employees. In the most recent fiscal year, when misconduct allegations were lodged against almost one of every five BOP employees, the charge was deemed sustained nearly 30% of the time. The majority received nothing more than a written reprimand or suspension. And in about one of every 25 cases, no action was taken at all. While it is important to identify and hold bad apples responsible, it is doubly important to put in place measures that will deter future employee misconduct and discourage cover-ups. We know that the problems facing BOP have existed for quite some time, and we also recognize that change will not happen overnight. But there are dangerous conditions which still exist today that threaten the safety of inmates and staff and require our immediate attention. Just two months ago, a whistleblower claimed that staff at FCI Hazleton are covering up serious misconduct that includes releasing the wrong inmates, physically and verbally abusing inmates, using racial slurs, attempting to cover up inmate escapes and misusing restrictive housing. Such behavior is unacceptable and cannot continue. By adding an additional independent layer of oversight, 
the Bipartisan Federal Prison Oversight Act would strengthen our federal prison system, bolster public safety, and provide a mechanism for incarcerated individuals and their loved ones to protect their civil and human rights. Last year and prior to Director Peters' appointment, Ranking Member Sheila Jackson Lee visited several facilities in Beaumont, Texas, following an incident that triggered a national lockdown of BOP's institutions. There she found staff who said that they were overworked and underpaid, and the staff at Hazleton agree. They reported chronic understaffing resulting in massive amounts of mandated overtime as well as reliance on medical staff and counselors to fill in as correctional officers. Staff at USPI Atlanta and FCI Jessup experiencing similar staffing issues report that fatigue, exhaustion, and low morale have reduced staff productivity and led to more sick leave retirements, resignations, and staff leaving, leaving to other agencies for better pay. Since ranking member Jackson Lee's visit, Director Peters has deployed various strategies to recruit and retain staff by securing and providing retention incentive bonuses at certain facilities and changing the marketing messaging. I am encouraged by a conversation that I had with her just recently where she explained that the BOP's turnover rate has decreased by 20%. Staffing is at 70% for correctional officers. The agency is at 90% overall staffing and 198 out of 200 positions for re-entry coordinators have been filled. In addition to staffing challenges, an increasing number of facilities and supporting infrastructure have reached or exceeded their usable, their useful life, such as USP Atlanta, which is one of the oldest BOP facilities in the country. So far, Director Peters and her team have identified a $2 billion deficit around the facilities that prioritizes only those repairs and improvements that address risks to life and safety. To be clear, Director Peters has made great progress during her short term at BOP, and she should be applauded for that. Not only has she taken steps to better care for BOP staff, she has also prioritized humanizing conditions for prison population. In our recent conversation, Director Peters shared that BOP is collaborating with the National Institute of Justice to improve the use of restrictive housing while BOP staffers are surveying various states to determine best practices, which should please many of us. I am sure that like me, Ranking Member Jackson Lee would want to know when we can see a change in BOP's use of restricted, restrictive housing since recent statistics show that BOP is utilizing this practice more now than in the previous decade. There is still so much work to be done at BOP, an agency that is a critical component of overall safety of the country. The agency has a responsibility to focus on each of the critical issues it faces to carry out the ideals of justice and accountability while promoting successful rehabilitation and maintaining the custody and control of incarcerated prisoners and persons in a humane and safe manner. In sum, BOP must fully carry out every aspect of its mission, and Congress must ensure BOP has the tools and funding that it needs to do so. Thank you for being here today, Director Peters. I look forward to our discussion and ask uh, Mr. Chairman for unanimous, unanimous consent to enter into the statement uh, of ranking member Jackson Lee. Without objection. Record. Thank you. General lady yields back. Uh, without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. I will now introduce today's witness, uh, Ms. Colette S. Peters. Ms. Peters is the director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. She was sworn in by the Attorney General on August 2nd, 2022. She oversees 
122 Bureau of Prison Facilities, six regional offices, two staff training centers, and 22 residential reentry management offices. We welcome our witness today and thank her for appearing. And now we'll begin by swearing you in, Director, if you would please rise and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge and information and belief, so help you God? I do. Let the record reflect that the witness has answered in the affirmative. Um, again, uh, I want you to know your written testimony has been entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we will ask you to limit your opening remarks to five minutes. Uh, you'll see a yellow light, then a red light, and, um, and then after that, I'll kind of wave at you and maybe tap on the thing to just to remind you to, to, to wrap up. But we're, we're looking forward to hearing from you. And uh, with that, Ms. Peters, you are recognized for your five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Chairman Biggs, Ranking Member uh, Jackson Lee is not here. Thank you, Congresswoman Macbeth, uh, and members of the subcommittee. I am honored to appear before you today to discuss the important and impactful work happening at the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Since I was sworn in last August, I have visited more than 25 of our institutions, and these are my best days. It is a privilege to meet our corrections professionals while walking the halls of our institutions. They truly are my inspiration, and I am grateful for their dedication. It is with their important work in mind that we engaged in strategic planning and modernized our mission, our vision, and core values. We are now guided by the principles of normalcy and humanity and core values that emphasize accountability, integrity, respect, compassion, and correctional excellence. We engaged in proactive outreach to members of Congress, members of the media, advocacy organizations, and justice-involved individuals while maintaining a very collaborative relationship with our national union. This strategic vision, along with clear expectations, has put us on a course for success. The vast majority of our employees are hardworking, ethical corrections professionals who expect that those who are engaged in misconduct be held accountable. We added substantial resources in this last year to our Office of Internal Affairs. We collaborated with our law enforcement partners to investigate criminal misconduct and held individuals accountable up to and including termination and prosecution. I have communicated clear expectations that misconduct and retaliation will not be tolerated. I also want to address restrictive housing because despite our efforts over the last few years to drive these numbers down, we have seen them increase. While I am glad to report that we have seen them start to decrease over the last couple of months, we have much work to do. We know restrictive housing is not an effective deterrent, and it can increase an individual's future criminality. So we created a short-term plan and a long-term plan. First, we formed a work group comprising of our members of our executive team who have traveled across the country to review best practices from other correctional systems, uh, around the country and around the globe. Long term, we entered into a historic partnership with the National Institute of Justice, and they are going to bring an external organization of experts in to provide recommendations. The success of reforms like these will rely on the work of our correctional professionals, and we need more of them. So we have been working diligently on our recruitment and retention crisis. Since the beginning of this year, we have seen a 60% increase in new hires and a 20% decrease in individuals leaving our organization. When I was sworn in last year, we had an 86% fill rate, and to date we have filled 90%. Yet we are still not where we need to be, and until we solve this problem, we must continue to be concerned about employee wellness and our need to rely on augmentation and overtime. Another major issue for our employees is our maintenance and repair backlog. Healthy facility structures are critical to our operations, and yet we have a $2 billion maintenance and repair backlog, which only accounts for the most serious categories, those safety and life categories. 
We are contracting again with an external organization to come in and assess our overall problem. Now inside these structures, we are the de facto mental health hospital, the largest provider of alcohol and drug treatment, and we have nearly 160,000 patients, many of whom come to us with very complex issues and chronic disease. With these complexities, we must ensure that we operate holistically as a healthcare organization, and we have contracted with an external entity to provide recommendations on correctional health best practices and in implementing those principles of normalcy and humanity. We remain committed to First Step Act implementation. Roughly 104,000 individuals are participating today in over 110 evidence-based programs and productive activities, and more than 25,000 have been released through the application of earned time credits. As I have said many times, I believe in accountability, oversight, and transparency, and I know we cannot do this work alone. So Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I am honored to speak with you on behalf of our dedicated employees across the country. This concludes my opening statement, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Director, we appreciate that. And um, now I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. I was very heartened by your discussion of site visits to our prisons to get a uh, firsthand understanding of what's going on there. Uh, sometimes members of Congress have had challenges doing that. Could you give us some advice if, if we wanted to glean those benefits and get that firsthand uh, experience? But what's the best way for us to go about that with your team? Thank you, Congressman. So if you have your team reach out to our Office of Legislative Affairs, we will be happy to make that arrangement. Thank you so much. Um, does the Bureau of Prisons retaliate against people based on, political, on, on constitutionally protected speech? I have been very clear that retaliation will not be stood for on my watch. And, and you're confident that that's being observed throughout the Bureau? I'm confident that message has been delivered, and if anyone engages in retaliation, we will hold them accountable. Are you familiar with the matter of John Strand? That name is not familiar to me, okay, no. So Mr. Strand was a witness at a hearing that we had uh, regarding some of the civil rights concerns of people who had interacted with the Department of Justice in January 6 uh, matters. He was convicted, sentenced in his, at FCI Miami, and I had received a word that he had been placed into enhanced confinement and into higher acuity, uh, uh, secure, securing uh, as a consequence of information that others had put out on his Twitter feed. So is that something you, does that ring a bell to you? Congressman, I wouldn't be able to speak to an individual's um, circumstances regarding their behavior inside our institutions. What I can assure you is that if an individual is placed in our special housing unit, it would be for conduct that happened inside the institution. So is, what's a special housing unit? Is that a special housing unit is one of our uh, restrictive housing placements that could include disciplinary segregation, protective custody, um, and would house individuals that either were at harm to harm their, themselves or others, or had actually engaged in misbehavior inside our institutions. What, what I'm worried about is that Mr. Strand gave us testimony about some of his concerns, and as you know, people give us testimony, we sort through what's right and wrong and should be acted on and shouldn't be acted on. It's not gospel, it's just testimony. Uh, but then thereafter, people were posting on some of his social media platforms his concerns about the treatment he'd received at the Bureau. And then I sent a letter to you concerned about that because like you, I don't want anyone retaliated against for constitutionally protected speech. And, and thereafter, I got a letter back from the aforementioned Office of Legislative Affairs in your office and they say, in part, Mr. Strand was moved to a secure housing unit with increased supervision and frequent employee contact on September 26, 2023, pending completion of an investigation. So I guess my question is, when, when someone, is that like akin to what we would normally think about as solitary confinement? Those words, secure housing unit with increased supervision and frequent employee contact? We would use the word restrictive housing. Okay, so what's this then? Because this guy's a non he was never violent toward anyone, so I'm just wondering why the, the assets that we fund for the highest acuity violent people would be used for this purpose. Uh, Congressman, we use that uh, special housing unit for individuals that 
um, engage in any sort of misconduct inside our institutions. I don't know what he, he was found to be guilty of by our hearings administrative process that would warrant his uh, need to go into restrictive housing, but I assure you we have administrative processes that people have to go through before those placements actually occur. Yeah, I, I get that you, you can't know the conditions of every single prisoner throughout the Bureau. This is one I've ripened and sent to you because I am worried that throughout our, DO, our Department of Justice and, and what we've endured, that there are some people who are sort of being used as pawns and they're being mistreated in order to send a message to other people. And I'm grateful that you've said here that is not your doctrine. You don't want to see that happen. But you also haven't been able to share with us an entire confidence that that isn't happening in some cases. And I'm worried that it's, it's happening here. Have you heard of the matter of Owen Schreyer? No, that name is not familiar to Very me. Very similar fact pattern. You know, somebody who'd sort of spoken out, was, was prominent in the public, was convicted as a consequence of activities on January 6th, and now feels as though there's specific Bureau of Prison retaliation. I don't think any group of people should be retaliated against, so I look forward to taking you up on the offer to perhaps go in a, and, and do some site visits and, and see how people are being treated and get that information directly. So I, I hope I get prompt cooperation from OLA. I uh, thank the chair and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Gates. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Georgia, Ms. McBath, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Director Peters, I have introduced the Federal Prison Oversight Act, which I'm sure you're aware of, to increase the accountability and the transparency across our prison system. To ensure that the safety of our prisoners is a top priority, we need to have uh, an efficient method of identifying the high-risk facilities that require more guidance and more attention. Director Peters, you know, what system uh, or metric system does the BOP offer to be able to identify these kinds of facilities? Thank you, Congresswoman. I think that we have a variety of oversight that helps us identify the high-risk facilities, including oversight from the Government Accountability Office, the Office of the Inspector General, and also our Program Review Division, who conducts um, audits of our institutions, including unannounced site visits and audits. And we rely on that data, including our uh, regional offices that go in and perform um, independent reviews, interviewing the adults in custody, interviewing our employees, and creating an assessment of each one of our institutions um, so that we can address problems early on um, rather than waiting uh, down the road. Thank you. And in our meeting last week, we discussed the national recidivism rate, and I was pleased to learn that BOP has achieved a staffing level of reentry coordinators to 99%. That I commend you on that, with 100% expected very soon. What steps should we, as members of Congress, take to support those reentry programs and to reduce recidivism um, rates further than wh where they are now? Thank you, Congresswoman. I think resources are always the issue. I think the um, our ability to contract with our residential reentry centers is really a golden nugget at the Federal Bureau of Prisons because they are in the communities that these individuals are coming back to. They know what resources are there, and they're able to provide those wraparound resources as it relates to programming, treatment, education, employment, so that they become productive, tax-paying citizens once they enter our community. Mm -hmm. And last Congress, Ranking Member Jackson Lee, who's not with us today, convened two hearings on the oversight of BOP with a focus on the need to implement the First Step Act. Um, and she wanted to implement that fully and very, very thoughtfully. Since then, Director Peters has created policies that have actually corrected BOP's impl implementation of FSA, First Step Act. Yet inmates continue to complain about the lack of classes and I understand that there's still no reliable calculator yet to determine the number of FSA credits that a prisoner can actually earn during their time in prison and a shortage of halfway house placements. Director Peters, can you just kind of tell us how you intend on solving this problem? Thank you, Congresswoman. So we're very proud of our first step. Act implementation. We have over 104,000 people participating in programs today in over 110 evidence-based programs and productive activities. 
and yet we can do better. As we ha now have pivoted out of the pandemic, um, being able to pull people into classrooms was difficult during that time period. And now as I visit our institutions and talk to our employees and our wardens, they're ex thrilled to talk about the ideas they have around expanding our programs and expanding space inside our institutions. That's been really difficult. Um, so they're getting really creative about that as well. I think your expansion of Pell Grants and the access to those in our care and custody is going to be magnificent for this population and their ability to engage in that higher level education after receiving their GED. So I think we are on the right track. Again, you talked about um, overtime and augmentation, so recruitment and retention. Solving that problem is going to solve a lot of other underlying problems at the Bureau, including our ability to continue that programming so that we're not pulling those people that lead those programming or those teachers from their, their posts as teachers onto the units to be correctional officers. I have one last question for you. Would you object to an additional layer of oversight at BOP? I always welcome oversight. I'm going to say that again and again. Um, the only thing I would ask is that when you consider additional oversight in legislation, that we then receive the appropriate resources so that I'm not left flat-footed with additional requests and additional oversight or additional requests for information, and then we don't have the staff and resources to respond in a timely and efficient manner. Thank you so much. appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman McBath. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Nels. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Peters, thank you for being here. Uh, as you know, in 2018, President Donald J. Trump rightfully rolled back Obama-era policies related to its Transgender Offender Manual. President Trump's policy simply removed a sentence that instructed BOP officials to consider transgender inmates' gender identity when making decisions regarding prison housing. President Trump mandated BOP officials use biological sex, now biological sex, as the initial determination for placement decisions. I believe this was common sense. I think America would agree. Uh, ladies uh, should be held with ladies, and I think men should be housed with men. But in a string of policy reversals over the past three years, President Biden reissued Obama's guidelines. Given even further to require prison staff to use a transgender person's preferred names and pronouns. Uh, you agree with this? Uh, Congressman, we are required to provide medical and mental health care for all individuals, including those who so that answer, identify then as that's transgender. So that answer, that's a yes, pretty yes. much a yes, okay. In your testimony, you stated recognizing that incarcerated women, including those in the LGBTQ community, require different resources and support than men. We recognize that we must create environments now, create environments for these bad hombres that respond to the realities of women's lives and address the issues specific to their lived experiences, end quote. So can you provide the definition of a woman? What is a woman, since you believe there's a difference? Uh, Congressman, so I think in the supermajority of our housing placements at the Federal Bureau of Prisons, we place individuals based on their biological sex. Um, all but 11 individuals at the Federal Bureau of Prisons are um, placed in housing assignments based on their biological sex okay. in their... When does that appropriate... start then, Director? So, okay, so I just got convicted of robbing convenience stores. And all of a sudden I go to court and they convict me and I'm going to prison. And now instead of saying my name is Troy Nails, I'm now going to say my name is Susie Nails and I am a woman, right? I just make that claim. At what point in time during this spectrum will that allow me then to release the bull into the pen of heifers? So, Congressman, in this scenario, I suspect you're talking about producing a false claim and that- well, whatever, I mean, how can you deny it? Man. I believe I'm a woman now. But what, what would happen then is it would trigger a very complex, serious evaluation from degreed medical, medical doctors and psychologists who would conduct an evaluation um, based on your gender identity. Have we released, to your knowledge, have we released anybody that has not gone through the transition into the pen of heifers? Have we released them? Sorry, sir. Yes, not if I say I'm a man, I'm a woman now, and I haven't had any surgeries up to this point, maybe I'll get them while I'm in prison, because I'm assuming we're paying for those, right? We have paid for two gender-affirming Hey, two. So once you start, 
you're going to continue. You ain't changing that, right? There are five. I mean, look at this guy. This is an interesting guy, folks. Look at this guy. His name is Peter Langan. He got long hair. Look at this guy. He looks like a bad, bad guy. He is a bad guy. He's a, he's a Nazi, ex-Nazi terrorist. He's a bad, bad hombre. And this guy wants to be referred to as Donna. Do your, do your employees, do you require them to say, call this guy now named, he must be called Donna? Uh, Congressman, no. And in fact, in order to produce a name change. Well, he's suing. He's suing you all because he wants to, uh, he wants to, he's claiming that his Eighth Amendment rights were violated for not being provided gender conforming surgery. For the people at home, this man is an ex-Nazi bank robber. In June, his lawsuit was settled, and I'd like to know whether this means that inmates now have the Eighth Amendment right to sex changes. Are we paying for guys like this who are just sick? We send them to prison, we're restricting their freedom, and now this guy says he wants to be Donna. I suppose I understand why he'd want to be Donna, because you want to release this guy into the pen of heifers. You're releasing the stud into the pen of heifers is what you're doing. Isn't that what a guy would want to do? If I'm going to prison for 10 years and you're restricting my freedom, I guess I would want to go to the prison where the ladies are. Wouldn't you suggest that? Wouldn't that be a good idea? And if you're allowing that to take place through this process by talking to these shrinks and these guys, I'm going to convince you I'm a woman and I'm going to enjoy five years in prison. Matter of fact, Half of them would probably say, don't even release me on patrol. I'm having too much fun here. Congress. I'm having too much fun. It is disgusting, quite honestly, what we've done to this, to our country. Uh, Biden, uh, three daughters, you're, you're, I have some real issues. They're very troubling. You can do better than that. I yield. Thank you, Mr. Nels. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, uh uh, Madam Chair and Director Peters, thank you for your dedication to public service and corrections work. I, suppo I suppose that the most likely scenario that presents to the Bureau of Prisons when an individual uh, comes into the system and is of the LGBTQ uh, um, status or category, uh, that person oftentimes is in the middle of a sex change operation like the January 6th insurrection defendant who broke into the Capitol and was convicted after a jury trial. Is that correct? I, Congressman, I wouldn't be able to speak to an individual person who's incarcerated. Yeah, but, but you're, you're familiar generally. with the case that I'm talking about, though, right? I'm not familiar with that specific oh, okay. case. Okay. Well, there's a, a, a woman who was a defendant, Formerly, uh, well, let, let me say she's in transition from being a man to a woman, led a column of uh, insurrectionists up the stairs of the Capitol. Uh, but clearly, uh, you know, she was in the midst of a sex change operation. And, and you treat folks with humanity when they present to the Bureau of Prisons, despite the fact that. Uh, you know, over the years, uh, uh, Director Peters, uh, actually since uh, the, the 80s, when Ronald Reagan came in with a tough on crime, eliminate, um, uh, um, uh, eliminate um, rehabilitation, uh, focus on punishment, um, and uh, low taxes, less government, along with bills that uh, from the Congress that produced more federal inmates because of a dramatic push in, in uh, new laws. Um, so what we've seen is an explosion of prison inmates. Actually, uh, inmates, uh, actually, uh, the prison population almost doubled uh, uh, by 2000. Isn't that correct? It has grown dramatically in the and, last two and decades. It's, yes. And it's, it has continued to grow since then, while at the same time there have been major cost or major funding reductions uh, for the Bureau of Prisons. Isn't that correct? While our budget continues to grow, it is not growing in line with the population. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, you've got about, uh, according to a roll call uh, article, uh, uh, I'm looking at here, Congress is poised, it's dated uh, September 12th of 23, of 2023, Congress 
is poised to spend less next fiscal year on federal prison infrastructure, even as a federal watchdog reported this year that the agency is in dire need and has lowballed maintenance funding requests for years. And according to this article, uh, you've got about $2 billion in uh, needs, but yet uh, funding from this MAGA Republican uh, Republican uh, conference in 2023, their draft commerce, justice, and science spending bill puts forward uh, a mere $273 million. Isn't that correct? Congressman, we have a $2 billion reported problem. I will share with the committee that's an old number. We're hoping to get a better assessment on, a, on it's the around, number. It, it's far more than It's far more than $2 billion, million. and over the last 10 years, the average allocation for maintenance and repairs was about $100 million a year. And so also staffing shortages are impacted by reduced federal revenue. Isn't that correct? We, our recruitment and retention um, issue, I think, is compounded both by the economy right now and the workforce, as well as changes on how people view law enforcement positions. So the same Republicans who come up here and uh, criticize you and the Bureau of Prisons today are the same ones who historically have defunded uh, your operation. Let me ask you this, uh, Director Peters. Do you believe that the Bureau of Prisons could benefit from independent oversight? Uh, Congressman, as I've said before, I, I believe in oversight. I welcome oversight. And um, it, we've made it very clear inside the Bureau that when the Government Accountability Office um, shows up for an audit or the Office of the Inspector General comes in for an unannounced audit, that we will open our doors and welcome them in. Do you think that would be helpful? Yes, I do. I believe that that oversight is helpful. Um, the Office of the Inspector General has begun unannounced audits and visits now that we are out of the pandemic, and I think those visits have proved very, um, very helpful. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Moore, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Director Peters, thank you for being here today. And, uh, you know, um, I as a Christian, I know a lot of times we live under grace and, and we certainly need forgiveness. And, and I don't think there's an exemption for prisoners. I think people who are incarcerated also need second chances. I'm, I'm a proponent of that. And in Alabama, we have an amazing prison system. And one of them in spe specifically is J.F. Ingram, where they actually bring the in incarcerated individuals over to a college next door. And they do this, certain individuals are picked out, and then they train them in skills. And so some are certified welders when they come out. Some are body people. Some can do cosmetics, all kind of neat stuff. And we've learned that the recidivism rate is so much lower coming out of J.F. Ingram right now than any system in Alabama. And so I'd encourage you to look at the model there for what they do. You actually, being a, as a business owner, people come to me all the time looking for jobs. And so if I got an individual that walks in that's been incarcerated, but he actually can lay a bead on a welder, I may not start him at the same pay rate that I would somebody who has a clean record, so to speak. But, but at the same time, I'll start him a little lower, maybe, or him or her, depending on what, uh, like Sue Nails maybe comes in looking for a job. But uh, the point of the matter is, is that if they have a skill set, we can put them in the workforce. And uh, they don't go back to the same old, same old. They don't go back to the same group of people, the same group of people that, that they were running with prior to being incarcerated. And so, uh, we found that recidivism rates have dropped dramatically, and so I'm working on legislation now with, with uh, actually it's bipartisan legislation uh, with a member of Tron, and uh, we're looking at the ID coming out of prison for somebody to get a, a, an ID, and this is not for anybody who is illegal. They have to be U.S. citizens. I have to remind my friends they have to be U.S. citizens, but we would certainly appreciate your support. And, are, are you aware of that, that we're working to try to get an ID issued by the federal prison system so when people come out that if they go for a job, and this is not something to vote with anything like that, but if they go for a job or if they, they have to get housing, sometimes they have an ID, we, we, uh, we think this is one way to help recidivism, and I, and I think it's something you look at. Are, are you aware of that program and what we're doing? Congressman, I am, and I've uh, had this conversation with Congressman Trone. You'll be pleased to know that we piloted an ID program, and it was successful, so we're now rolling it out to all of our institutions. So beginning at the top of next year, everyone leaving our custody will uh, leave with an ID issued by the Federal Bureau of Prisons where we need your help 
is states accepting them. Um, so right now we have about 15 or 16 states that say that they'll accept them at the Department of Motor Vehicles, um, but only 16. So any help you can give there would be tremendously, uh, we'd be filled with gratitude. And you know, to me, this is a fiscal conservative issue in a sense that if we, what are we, what are we paying per prisoner now to house them in the federal prisons annually for an individual? Uh, uh, on a daily rate, I think the average is about $122 a day. Gotcha, gotcha. So, for every individual that we can get uh, into the workforce, into society, working and producing, I think that that's a long-term win for the American people, certainly for society and communities. And so we'll be working with you on that issue. But again, I, I would encourage you to check into J.F. Ingram. What they're doing there is, and, and listen, I'm as conservative and I'm hard on crime as anybody, but I understand grace as well. And there are people who get into that system. Sometimes they just need opportunities. If we can train them and get them with a the skill set into society, I think we as America will benefit, communities will benefit, certainly society will benefit. And so thank you for being here today and look forward to working with you on that legislation. And with that, Madam Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Fry, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Director, for being here. Uh, FCI Bennettsville is a medium security uh, federal correction institution and houses 1,600 inmates in Marlboro County, South Carolina, my district. Uh, we've heard accounts from officers um, having to work overtime, uh, which has led to extreme burnout and low morale. Uh, a GAO report found uh, that overtime hours worked at the BOP surged by 102% during a four-year period. What is the BOP doing to correct this? We've done a lot in the last year, Congressman, so I'm happy to talk about it. We doubled down on our recruitment efforts. We have a national recruitment office that does nothing but recruit for office uh, for the Federal Bureau of Prisons. We prioritized officers and healthcare workers in that, and we've seen progress. We've given retention and recruitment bonuses to individuals, and that has proven successful. And it has allowed us to see um, a small amount of improvement, 60%. Um, increase in those coming to the Bureau and a 20% decrease in those leaving in the last year, but we're not where we need to be yet. Well, and I would imagine that with the forced overtime, it is a, it is a recruitment issue that you don't have people that are applying. What is, the, what is the cause of that? Or what are some of the causes of that? Congressman, I would say, as it relates to overtime, it's a retention issue as well. As I walk the halls of our institutions and talk to our employees, that's what I hear. They're exhausted. They were exhausted before the pandemic, and the pandemic wore them out, and our increased overtime did as well. And it's not just the physical and mental wearing. We're wreaking havoc on the family. So spouses are planning who's picking kids up from daycare, who's cooking, um, and we mess that schedule up day in and day out because of that required overtime. So it's a problem we have to solve for the health and well-being of our employees and their families. Thank you for that. And Director, I want to turn to a different issue right now. Uh, I've heard about this at, at Bennettsville and really prisons and jails across the country, and it's the issue of contraband, namely cell phones. Uh, the South Carolina Department of Corrections Director Brian Sterling recently stated that contraband cell phones in prisons are the number one public safety threat that we face in South Carolina and in the country. To address this threat, the De South Carolina Department of Corrections has partnered with wireless providers utilizing Managed Access System Evolved, or MASSE technology, to identify and disable those devices. Uh, since July, nearly 800 devices have been uh, found in uh, a, a South Carolina Bishopville uh, institution, uh, 800 devices found in a prison of 1,000 inmates is, is real alarming. What is the Bureau of Prisons doing uh, to address, to combat this issue, and are you open to exploring the use of Massey technology or something similar that would, that would have a similar effect? Congressman, thank you. We, we do utilize that technology. I couldn't agree more with Director Sterling. He and I have talked about this on multiple occasions and at length. Um, and so we use technology that captures all sig sing cellular signals, excuse me, and we also use technology that jams the cellular signal. We're piloting both of those. The, uh, the original feedback that we're getting from folks is it's better when we detect because then we can investigate and find the cell phone and hold people accountable, but the jamming technology also works. We also are able to deploy a mobile, mobile cellular assessment, literally, literally a van that goes out into our parking lots and can tell us how many cell phones are pinging so that we can hone our investigative resources 
based on where those cell phones are inside the institutions. And those are pilot programs right now? Those are pilot programs right now. How many now. facilities use that pilot program? Um, let's see, at the ones that capture the cellular signals, we're doing it at four facilities. And the micro jamming, we are deploying at six facilities. When do you anticipate, or what, what is maybe the goal of the BOP in expanding that uh, to be able to use at all facilities? Uh, again, it would require resources from Congress, but it would be uh, incredibly beneficial if we could have these at all of our institutions. We're focusing on our high risk, uh, high classified facilities right now, but these are also issues at our secure lows and our camps. And so we would appreciate being have, having access to this technology at all 122 facilities. What do you think the cost of that would be? Congressman, I don't know what that would be, but I can talk to my team and get back to you. Please do. I'm certainly interested in that. I'm going to shift with my last 25 seconds. One of the things that I'm looking at is BOP pays um, a range from GL5 to GL8. Other agencies like ICBP, they pay at a different rate, a much higher rate. What factors uh, contribute to BOP starting salary being lower than other agencies? Uh, and are you open to raising that base pay to, to, to help attract and retain uh, individuals at BOP? Absolutely. So um, our officers do not get paid enough. Um, we have trouble keeping them. State corrections will offer uh, higher salaries than what we pay. Um, even local sheriffs are able to pay more than what we're able to pay in certain regions. So we would welcome any changes to that pay structure um, and any support you could give in that, both in the pay structure and in the funding. We were able to increase this year by about $2,000, the top salary of our correctional officers, and hope to recruit a better, a larger lot, and retain the ones that we do have. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fry. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Kiley, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for being here to testify. Uh, Director Peters, uh, I've always uh, strongly believed that a well-functioning criminal justice system needs to have appropriate penalties uh, for offenders, while at the same time uh, having uh, evidence-based tools for rehabilitation in order to uh, facilitate uh, the re-entry of, of prisoners into society when they are released and to make them uh, productive members uh, of society. And, uh, you know, I come from a state, California, uh, where unfortunately both objectives uh, have, uh, have not been achieved, where we've lowered penalties across the board in really reckless ways while also uh, undercutting uh, the capacity of our criminal justice system to rehabilitate offenders. Uh, for example, a law called Prop 47 effectively legalized uh, drug use, and that not only has led to the sort of uh, horrific scenes that we see in places like San Francisco, uh, but it's also decimated the drug courts in our state because offenders no longer have any sort of entry point to then be, uh, you know, uh, forced to go into some sort of drug treatment program, and so people are not able to overcome uh, their addictions. So uh, properly uh, understood, I believe that punishment and rehabilitation are not sort of contrasting approaches uh, to criminal justice, but rather uh, they go hand in hand and are both uh, serving the interest of public safety. Uh, another way in which this has sort of gone awry in California is something called realignment, where a lot of our serious offenders have been moved from the prisons into the county jails, which aren't really set up to have the sort of rehabilitation programs that are evidence-based and will help people uh, to turn their lives around. So I'm always looking for suggestions uh, for, uh, for my state, for the likes of Governor Newsom, who have gotten this uh, so wrong. Uh, and I'm you know, looking to other states, and I know that uh, the federal government, the federal correction system, has recently undertaken uh, some different approaches to rehabilitation with uh, literacy programs, occupational education programs, uh, trade skill programs, sus substance abuse disorder programs. So uh, I was hoping you could just give us a little sense of how this is working out and where you've seen success. Thank you, Congressman. So as your previous neighbor to the north, as the director of the Oregon Department of Corrections, I know that in my capacity there, we collaborated closely with the California Department of Corrections on evidence-based programs, on these principles of normalcy and humanity. And at the Federal Bureau of Prisons, I think our mission aligns with everything that you've just said. It's dual mission. Our job is to ensure public safety, both inside our institutions, but also when they leave our institutions. I'm a former 
victim's advocate, so I believe strongly that our job is to ensure they don't create new victims on the way out, but that second half of our mission is equally as important, and that's about providing programming and treatment and education so that they have the resources they need um, and the skills they need when they leave to be those productive tax-paying citizens. I think one of the jewels at the Federal Bureau of Prisons is our reentry uh, re centers in the community where we're able to contract with experts who live in those neighborhoods, live in those communities, and continue those services as they safely transition back into our neighborhoods. Would you agree with my assessment, since you have some insight on the matter, uh, that California's uh, realignment has uh, shifted uh, you know, offenders into an institutional setting uh, that is not uh, well equipped uh, to provide uh, proper evidence-based rehabilitation? Congressman, I know enough about it to be familiar with what you're saying, but I'm certainly not expert enough to speak to the benefits or the outcomes of that process. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Mr. Kiley. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from Missouri, Ms. Bush, for five minutes. Thank you, and thank you for being here, Director Peters. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, St. Louis and I are here today in support of genuine transparency, accountability, and oversight in our federal prison system. Director Pe Peters, as you know, you oversee a key component of our federal system of mass incarceration. Um, you are responsible for the conditions faced by nearly 160,000 incarcerated people and 35,000 staff members. Right now, we understand our prison system needs a lot of work, it needs help, and for many, many see it as a disgrace. I want to touch on a couple issues in this limited time that I have. First, um, uh, I want to say thank you for the work that you have done and for what you are trying to achieve. I know that it isn't easy coming into uh, and trying to change a system that is already so broken. Um, but I am deeply concerned by um, what we hear about oftentimes is the pervasive medical neglect of incarcerated people and um, those who have reported month long wait times for doctor's appointments and routine procedures, uh, retaliation from staff and fear when seeking medical care. Uh, several deaths may have been preventable, prevent, uh, well, preventable, had proper medical care been provided. And this issue is personal for me and my constituents because right now we are facing the, um, some of the same issues at the St. Louis City Justice Center. The Bureau must overhaul its approach to providing medical care for incarcerated people and set an example for local carceral facilities um, in St. Louis and around the country um, because we look to that to be able to go into those, into our local jails, um, to be able to say this is what should be done, this is the example. The other issue I want to address is solitary confinement. It is shameful that solitary has increased in the Bureau during the Biden administration despite the president claiming he supported ending it. Director Peters, um, you have repeatedly recognized the harms of solitary and the need for holistic rehabilitate, rehabilitative alternatives. You and I both know that solitary causes devastating harm and it worsens safety for everyone involved. Um, it drives anxiety, depression, psychosis, heart disease, self-harm, and suicide. And I know you know this from even before in your, your background before you took this position. And we also know that environments that are the exact opposite of solitary involve program-based interventions with full days of out-of-sale time and how they actually help both support people's health and it makes people, um, makes everyone safer, even the staff, um, because we also care about the staff. Um, so in, instead of taking action on this issue based on the overwhelming evidence, um, the proposal of further studies, can we talk about that? Um, isn't it true that we don't need yet another study, but rather an urgent action to replace solitary with proven alternative forms of, separ of separation? 
Congresswoman, first I'll address your health care issue. I want you to, uh, to assure you we want to be the model. Um, and as we pivot out of the pandemic, we're working through our backlog of that preventative health care that happened at the Bureau of Prisons, just like it happened in our communities. And we have secured a contract with an external group of experts who are going to come in and do a quality assurance of our health care and help us create that future vision where we can be the example. As it relates to restrictive housing, I want to move as fast as you do, Congresswoman, um, but I also know that we have to bring our people along, and I don't want to take a tool away from our correctional officers today without replacing it with a new tool tomorrow and with that training to ensure their safety. So we do have a short-term plan and a long-term plan. I think you'll be pleased to know the short-term plan is first we ensured that all the recommendations that have been brought to the Bureau in the past have been implemented. Um, and then the, our group of experts have traveled across the country to get best practices from other systems and bringing it back. We're actually meeting next week as an executive team. We will re we'll review those recommendations and get moving on that work. And then the partnership with NIJ is historic, Congresswoman. It's the first time that the Federal Bureau of Prisons will have an outside entity come in and take this global of a look at our restrictive housing. You and I share the same values. The more normalized environment we can create for the adults in custody, the better outcomes they'll have in the community, the fewer victims that will be created, and as you said, and most importantly, a better work environment for our people. Thank you. Looking forward to that, and our office will be in contact as that moves forward. And I yield back. Thank you, Congresswoman. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Congresswoman Bush. Uh, I now recognize myself for five questions, or for five minutes. Uh, Director Peters, thank you so much for, for being with us here today. Uh, I'd like to pick up right where you left off with Congresswoman Bush on the subject of special housing units. President Biden's executive order titled Advancing Effective, Accountable Policing and Criminal Justice Practices uh, touched on those special housing units and asked that you ensure that that type of housing is used rarely, applied fairly, and subject to reasonable constraints. Uh, I very much appreciate your prior answer indicating how much thought and study you are giving to the use of special housing units, uh, when and how they are applied, uh, but also wanted to note that we hear many correctional officers, including representatives from the Council of Prison Locals, have endorsed the continuing use of special housing units units as an essential tool for officer safety. Could you please speak a little more to your point about finding an alternative tool that if we are to try to reduce or uh, get closer to eliminating special housing units, uh, the necessity to have an alternative tool for those corrections officers available? Thank you, Congresswoman. That's very important to me. Their safety and security is top of mind every day as I do this work. Uh, I think one of the data points that I'll uh, take a deeper dive on is those individuals who are in special housing who are there because they're in protective custody status. So either because they've asked to be in the special housing unit because they don't feel safe or we've made an intelligence determination that they wouldn't be safe in uh, the general population. And so um, that's a large portion of our special housing unit. And so I think um, one of the recommendations that I'll likely uh, dive into more next week with my executive team is this notion of creating more safe and humane environments inside the prisons so that those individuals in protective custody status feel more comfortable in our general population units. And our uh, re, uh, reintegration units do just that, help these individuals step down from that high higher level of restrictive housing in a safe way, uh, safe for them and safe for our officers. And so I think that's a great model to advance this notion and these ideas. Thank you. I'd also like to touch on a new uh, effort to utilize licensed counselors in the employee assistance program uh, as part of your overall wellness and retention program for correctional officers. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Have you gotten, have these changes been implemented? Have you gotten any feedback on how that program is going? Thank you. So uh, employee wellness is incredibly important to me. As you know, the data points are really tough in law enforcement, specifically in corrections. And we've talked about overtime and augmentation and the impact there as well. So we have a lot of work to do. But we did change three of our policies this year. One of them included requiring that those counselors providing that employee assistance program counseling be certified. That has taken place. Um, and it's our hopes that that higher level certification will give 
a more meaningful um, session for those who have the courage to seek it. Now, as we're, we're nearing the end of our hearing time, so I'd also like to ask you uh, if there is something that you were hoping to share with us today that you haven't already touched on and uh, whether there is anything that we as Congress can be doing to further support you in your mission. Thank you, Congresswoman. So it's, I think the short answer to that is always resources. Um, the conversation we had earlier with your colleagues around being able to increase pay for our frontline workers would be incredibly helpful um, as we try to retain the ones we have and get the ones in the front door that we want. Um, training, we haven't talked about training yet today. One of the things that surprised me when I took this role was the small amount of training that our uh, employees receive on the front end. They get three weeks in the classroom and three weeks on the job. The data would suggest that the la average onboarding for law enforcement in this country is actually 21 weeks, so that's much shorter than that. My dream would be to have a training academy where we're able to train these individuals from recruitment to retirement and everything in between. And so I appreciate your support um, and appreciate the question very much. Thank you. And on the subject of recruitment and retention, you mentioned that you're working very hard on that uh, and focused in part on recruiting and retaining uh, by uh, enhancing the Bureau of Prisons image. Could you tell us, in, in your view, what image uh, is the Bureau of Prisons portraying and what would you like for it to be? Yes, yeah, so I think we've done a lot of work um, on this issue, and we're really looking for public safety-minded individuals who want to come and change hearts and minds, not that traditional, um, stereotypical uh, view of a correctional professional that the movies or TV might portray, but we have hard-working professionals who engage in really meaningful work, keeping our prison safe, um, but we ask them to do such complex work. They're not standing in the corner looking over people, they're engaging in conversations and helping them get into that programming, that treatment, and that education. So for anyone who is listening to this hearing today, the Federal Bureau of Prisons is hiring, and we're looking for those right people to come in and really do hero's work day in and day out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General Lady yields back. Director, thanks uh, for being here. Um, I apologize for having to had to step out, so I missed um, your, much of your testimony. I apologize for that. Um, one of the things that we talked about the other day uh, in our conversation uh, was that um, on behalf of a particular committee, we're conducting an investigation where I need to be able to get into interview and meet with um, a, a, an incarcerated individual. And so uh, I, I didn't have this response, but the response that we had received from BOP was, quote, it is not generally agency practice to facilitate such a visit, um, close quote. And so I'm seeking your commitment today that um, you'll help facilitate for um, me and my staff to be able to get in and meet with an incarcerated individual pertaining to an investigation we're conducting in a part of our Congressman, uh, Congressman at, at first glance, it appears there might have been some confusion around the initial request. Okay. And so as I committed to you when we met earlier last week, we're certainly happy to look into this um, and see what we can figure out. Thank you. Well, I'm hoping it's more than see what you can do. I'm hoping it's, you're gonna facilitate this our, our interview of that witness. Con Congressman, if we can facilitate that visit, we will do everything we can to facilitate that visit. Thank you, and I hope that we'll have good communication so we'll know what is necessary to facilitate that. Can you say that again, Congressman? Yes, I'm hoping that we have clear communication so we know exactly what we need to do and what we can expect. Yes, Congressman, uh, your staffer had um, our staffer's phone number, and so I know that they're going to connect. Okay, good, thank you. Um, question, does, uh, the Bureau of Prisons have any contracts with state or local governments or other outside groups to house prisoners? We contract with individuals in the community to run our residential reentry centers. They provide that step down service into the community um, and provide those wraparound services for reentry. Um, do you have any other uh, relationships with any other entities except for the residential reentry housing? Um, we would have. Uh, government agreements with other corrections agencies if they needed to house someone that they didn't think they could safely house at the state level, then we would um, engage in a prisoner swap, if you will, where we would then send them one of ours. Okay, so it's an intergovernment agreement of some yes. kind? Yes. Okay. Um, I know you talked about contraband. 
A study released earlier this year by DOJ's National Institute of Justice found, quote, detection technology such as radio frequency detection that can locate a cell phone signal or recognize components that are trafficked at multiple locations within a facility show the greatest promise for limiting cell phone contraband, close quote. How widely is radio frequency detection equipment deployed within BOP, and do you have the resources you need to ensure such detection equipment is available? Thank you, Congressman. We would appreciate the additional resources. We currently use, uh, we're piloting two pieces of technology, one that captures all cellular signals and another one that actually jams all cellular signals. The initial feedback I'm getting from my team is the preference to um, capture the cellular signals rather than jam them, because then we can actually deploy our investigative techniques find the phones and hold people accountable. Um, we're piloting those at a handful of facilities, but would love the resources to spread that technology out through all of our facilities. When you and I were talking, we talked about contraband, whether it's drugs or phones or others, and um, I asked you, um, how is contraband entering? And, and I'd like you to please explain that for us. Thank you. So unfortunately, sometimes that contraband comes through the front door um, by employees who are engaging misconduct or through visiting. But as you and I talked about, one of the most dangerous ways right now is drones. And so the ability for these drones to be able to carry an excessive amount of weight and drop it near the fence line or over the fence line is one of the things that we're working to combat every single day. And describe, for, I mean, that's an interesting thing, drones. Can you describe for us, you know, what, how you detect them uh, right now? What are you seeing? Um, I mean, when, is this happen like uh, one, one, uh, one location or is this a daily occurrence? Uh, what, what's the frequency? Congressman, this is a near daily uh, occurrence at the Federal Bureau of Prisons across our 122 institutions. Sometimes it's reoccurrence at the same institution and the same people, and we're able to detect those drones and deploy and activate local law enforcement. Um, so it is, an it is a constant engagement. We have detection devices at 31 of our high-risk institutions. Um, we've had over 100 and 80 drone sightings um, this year alone. Um, and while only a handful of those uh, ultimately m allowed us to find the drone, often we're finding the drops and the contraband that the, the drones have dropped. But we certainly rely on local law enforcement then to help us find the individuals who are flying those drones. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired, I, 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 and I think we've exhausted uh, the members. So. Thank you very much, Director, for being here. And I know that we'll have further opportunity to talk, and I know I have additional questions. So look forward to communication continuing. And with that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you.